works? Can you hear me? Thank you for coming. I'm so happy to see all of you. I'm Susan Platt, and I'm really thrilled to be introducing Tatiana Garmendia, who's given her talk a very fancy title here, Interdisciplinary Visual Jungian. That's something you're going to have to explain to all of us. But I'm very happy to have her here. I have three works by her that I can pass around. Uh, I, they'll be fine. You guys are OK with three works, just to get an idea of her printmaking. So um, Tatiana is an interdisciplinary artist with a figurative twist. Her work synthesizes formal concerns and a humanist engagement with history and culture. History is not a subject she just picked up from a dusty school book, but things that she actually lived. She played in abandoned missile trenches as a child when she was born in Cuba during the height of the Cold War. Repatriation from the Spanish government took the artist family first to Madrid and later to the USA. Garmendia's classical training began at the American University in Paris. Traveling throughout Europe, she also learned from the works of the old masters. Returning to the US, she continued her formal education at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston and Florida International University, where she earned a BFA in 1985. After college, the artist taught drawing and painting for five years, moved to New York to pursue graduate studies at the Pratt Institute of Art in Brooklyn. A college art conference, I remember that conference, I helped to organize it, in 1993 in Seattle, and she came to that and fell in love with Seattle. So she moved here with a fellowship, but she has been, te how long have you been teaching at Seattle? 30 years. 30? Yeah. 30. Yeah. Tatiana's been teaching at Seattle. It's now called Seattle College, right? Seattle, we, Se yeah. Seattle Central College. Yeah, they leave out community these days, but Seattle Central College for 30 years. and. Uh, I have like 10 pages here from her website of all the places that she's shown and all the collections that she's in. So I won't read all of them. Uh, and there's a brief summary here, but I'm not sure it's necessary to read all that. It's kind of boring. <laughs> so I've known Tatiana for many, many years where we go way back. And she is in this book, which is in the library. My most recent collected writings, I have a chapter on Tatiana's works. Tatiana Garmendia and the Immorality of War. It's a really powerful series. Welcome, Tatiana. Thank you, Susan. Can you all hear me? All right, thank you. So I am so happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me to speak with you today. Um, and so that's my name, Tatiana Garmendia, but that's my Americanized name. My true name, my full name, is Tatiana Estrella Montserrat Garmendi Codina. <laughs> the Solomon story, because I'm married to that guy back there taking pictures. <laughs> um, so today, here's the title of my talk today, Mythical Narratives, A Cuban Artist Explores Archetypes. And let's see if this thing works. Just like my art, this talk today is going to weave together various concepts. And they're like the layers of an onion. And while each layer or series that I'll talk to you about today may seem distinct. They're all part of a whole exploration. And my whole thing is archetypes. That's why I say I'm a visual Jungian, because my practice is predicated on exploring the narratives, the stories of archetypes as they express themselves in the studio. And they'll express themselves sometimes in filmmaking, sometimes in photography, often time in printmaking, which is what uh, Susan has, uh, in paintings and drawings, in sculptures and installations, 
I'll try anything. You know, I really will. Um, if it helps to tell a story. So uh, I'm going to touch ideas on archetypes. And for those of you who don't know what archetypes are, um, we can start with the idea that archetypes are universal and they're inborn models of people, behaviors, and personalities that influence human behaviors. And the Swiss psychiatrist Carl Jung theorized that archetypes were archaic forms innate in our human brain. It's like embedded. People from all over the world express archetypes in their lives and they express archetypes in their artwork. And um, there are four major archetypes. There's the persona, the shadow, the anima or animus, and the self. And each of these main archetypes intermingle and give rise to 12 archetypal figures, which you might have heard of, such as like the sage, the mother, the fool, and so on. Um, so let's see. So why does this Cuban girl have an interest in archetypes? Well, I'm going to say that the archetype of the shadow has been a part of my life since before my birth. So the potential for archetypes and how they express themselves in our world, so culturally and in our personal histories. And as we go through this, I'm pretty sure that every single person here has had a pretty long history. <laughs> so I'm not the only one here who can say, you know, history is something I've lived through. It's not something I picked up from a dusty book. Um, so everybody here has had history, and everybody here will start to see echoes of their own experiences, as different as our lives have been in my artwork, I hope. Um, so uh, on the right is a picture of my nuclear family before all hell broke loose, before the shadow broke us up. And kind of part of the reason why the shadow works so deeply in my family history and in our culture is pictured here on the left. So on the left is my great grand uncle, Carlos Brio Socarras. Does anybody know who he is? So Brio was the last freely elected president of Cuba. That was my grandmother's uncle. And he served 1948 until he was deposed by a military coup by Batista, and who was in turn <laughs> ousted by Fidel Castro. So he fled. He fled Cuba. My nuclear family stayed. And in fact, my grandparents had signs on their balconies, Fidel, esta es tu casa. Fidel, this is your home. Because they welcomed somebody who would liberate Cuba from the military dictator. Mm. Mm -hmm. Little did they know, yeah. So this is where my interest in uh, archetypes comes from. So we know he fled Cuba. My parents, sorry, I'm missing out. My parents, this is my older brother, my grandparents, my cousins, my godmother and aunt, and her, hus her first husband, and then my uncle. So in the center, my uncle Rudy is 20 years old. And he's studying in the US when the revolution happens. And my father's studying in Spain, meets my mom. They get married 12 days after meeting, because that's what people did when they fell in love back then. She herself was born during the Spanish Civil War. There's the shadow again. She was born during a bombing in um, Girona, in Gerona, Spain, Catalonia. 
And uh, she was orphaned at six years old. And so she meets my father. She was raised by the Franco government, by the nuns in the Franco government, so she was a fascist. And my father, coming from the Garmendia and Socarras family, was a socialist, <laughs> right? Because Prio was a socialist, not a communist, socialist. And they fell in love and they married. And so like I, I my husband and I, when we met, he was a Republican and I am as leftist as they come. <laughs> and, and yet we fell in love and we got married. So, you know, I don't understand the politics that happens today where people don't talk to each other, much less marry each other if they have different political ideologies. But um, that's very fascist to me. That's very Cuban. Like you can't have a divergent opinion, right? Uh, that's what Patria Vida is all about. Used to be Patria Muerte, now it's Patria Vida. So my uncle's in, in the US. Fidel Castro closes the borders. And my aunt sends my two cousins to the US. They're Peter Pan children. And they're being raised by my 20-year-old uncle. In the meantime, my parents ask for permission to leave the country. Then I'm born. And then the Bay of Pigs happens. And my uncle, now 22 years old, comes back from the US to fight the Bay of Pigs. And my father, who's a doctor in the Cuban army, is on the other side. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty interesting family history. Eventually, my father is punished by the Cuban government. And by now, I'm nearly six years old. My brother is eight. And we are all sent to a camp in Santiago. We used to live in La Habana, which is where I was born. And we were all sent to Santiago, Cuba, to a camp for political dissidents called La Trampa, or The Trap. It was a place where nobody could leave. That's why it was called La Trampa. There, you'll see some artwork. So some of the reason I'm giving you this history is some of my artwork directly engages archetypes through family history and through personal histories about being an immigrant, about being Cuban, about being punished. So the archetype of the hangman, it's a lot about migration. And sometimes it engages it indirectly. And so you'll see, you'll see how these histories intertwine with cultural histories that we all share, memories we all hold. Maybe we hold them personally, or maybe we hold them through television news or newspapers and so on. So some common grounds and patterns. Um, so here we see the symbolic quest, and we also see a military image. And this is a quote from this book pictured here. They're staggering. For here lie the roots of social, national bias and discrimination. Every minority and every dissenting group carries the shadow projection of the majority, be it the Negro, white, Gentile, Jew, Italian, Irish, Chinese, or French, non-communist. This is a little dated, obviously, from the language. Moreover, since the shadow is the archetype of the enemy, its projection is likely to involve us in the bloodiest of wars, precisely in the times of greatest complacency about peace and our own righteousness. The enemy and the conflict with the enemy are archetypal factors. So the reason, again, that I'm interested in archetypal projections is because they're central to the stories that the human body experiences and my work is figurative. And so my body remembers, and my body tells stories, both stories that I have experienced directly or that I have imagined or heard. Oh, that didn't do it. Let's try it this way. All right, so there are parallels between Carl Jung, Joseph Campbell's, and the Axis Mundi. And so we saw with Carl Jung, that he has 
the ordinary world, the world of the ego, and then the subconscious world, the world of dreams, of intuition, of the subconscious, of the shared um, knowledge that we all have. And they're visually very similar to the ordinary world that Joseph Campbell describes in The Hero's Journey, is akin to the conscious, the special world of mythology in The Hero's Journey is the great collective unconscious. And that's very similar to the Axis Mundi, like we see in Leonardo's illustration here. The spine is like the vertical of a cross. The arms create the horizon on which we walk. All of the immaterial senses are above it. So we see, we hear, we smell, we taste, touch with our hands and with our feet, the ground we walk on. And so this is the same thing as the axis mundi, right? We are here in the center, the world of the ordinary and the world of the mythic happens. So I see the human figure as a kind of measure of the cosmos, as a measure of what is both tangible and intangible what is physical and what is spiritual, what is personal and what is collective, right? There's all these wonderful intersections. So you wanna think of this as like that onion being peeled. Okay, I've clearly stopped reading my notes. <laughs> so I see my work as an artist akin to the work of a shaman. It's a sacred journey, right? Uh, as a visual youngin, I take my work both seriously and playfully. So to uh, one side, you see my self-portrait from the Karatis series. This is me as the fool, because <laughs> I really am a fool. And anybody who uh, has ever looked at a tarot card might recognize also that the, pos the posture is one that is used in the rider weight. You're stepping off a cliff, but you're smiling and you're happy just the same. Kind of like what happens every time you're at the easel. You step off the cliff and you're happy. Let's see what we discover. Um, and I also notice that this is a very ancient image. This is a Paleolithic uh, cave art drawing known as the Sorcerers in Les Trois Frères in Ariège, France. Um, and this is the artist as shaman, right? This is the artist as shaman leading us to this intersection between the mundane and the extra mundane, between our personal histories and our collective histories. And while my shamanistic art deals with the human figure, that is the world of culture, the world of the human being, the ancient shaman, we see him transformed into an animal, deals with not just culture, but with nature as well. Maybe as I mature, <laughs> my work will also mature and delve a little bit more with nature. Um, so I'm interested in the stories that we tell each other and whisper to ourselves that we carry in our personal and communal histories and our myths and dreams. And so all that interest, I have to use language. ¿Qué idioma voy a usar? Uso el español. Do I use English? Peut-être le français? So, how do we understand each other? How do we understand our stories and our dreams when don't, we don't speak the same language? And there's so many archetypes. There's over 300 in this list. When you take those basic 12 and start to mix them, how do we understand these stories? So one of the things that if these archetypes are our shared language, then it doesn't matter what story I tell you will recognize it in one way or another. Just like uh, we were looking at um, the artists outside, and it was wolf, raven, eagle, and orca down in the basement, and I, I'm not a Native American, but I can look at it and I, I can see it, right? Because it's dealing with nature, it's dealing with archetypes, it's the same thing as the artist shaman, right? It's connecting the culture and the, and the natural world in a language we can all understand. So for me, the easel is a place to dream those archetypes. 
And so I'm gonna start actually looking at my artwork. Um, because <laughs> I've given you a lot of history, uh, and I still haven't, you know, laid my egg. Um, in Spanish, you say, lay your egg. <laughs> Stop clucking and lay your egg. I still haven't laid my egg. So before I discovered alchemy, I had a series of dreams which dealt with the same theme. Beside my house stood another, and I, I'm going to ask, after I tell you this dream, I'm going to see how many of y'all have had this dream, because I'm pretty sure that many of you have had it. So I dream that beside my house there's another, and it has a different wing or annex that I'm unfamiliar with. It's very strange to me. And each time I wonder in my dream why I don't know this house, that it had apparently always been there, I find another room. So this is actually a quote from Carl Jung. I was astounded when I read this because I've had that dream. Have you had that dream? Yeah. You've had that dream? Anybody else? Let me see some hands. How many people have had a dream that they wander into a house that they're not familiar with, but they kind of know they should be there? Maybe it's their house. You've, we're the only weirdos here, Susan. <laughs> you, <laughs> okay, a couple of other weirdos here. We all, we have something in common with Carl Jung. <laughs> a school works. Yeah, it's a place that you should be familiar with, but it has all these rooms and these hallways you're unfamiliar with and you're exploring them and maybe you find something wonderful in there, right? So that's Carl Jung's dream and I'm like, what on earth? This is my dream, I have this. Um, so in my dream, I discover all kinds of dresses. <laughs> that may be saying something about me. But I discovered dresses and perfumes, wonderful perfumes. A lot of times I'd wake up with a smell of flowers and sandalwood and wonderful things just filling my senses and filling the room, even though, you know, it's not like I had, I had um, sprayed some deodorizer. Um, so I'd uncover this hidden space. And this is all in Jung's mind, the idea of synchronicity of the subconscious bubbling up and giving you ideas about what's really happening, about alchemy, about changes and transformation happening in your life. So while I'm having all these dreams about discovering all these different rooms and dresses, I go to Goodwill and I come across a whole bunch of um, bridal magazines and something compelled me to buy them. Now, I've been married for 18 years. I didn't need to look at any bridal magazines. In fact, I was married in a tie-dye dress. It was pretty, it was silk. It wasn't like some cheap, you know, um, Goodwill dress. Um, but it was still a tie-dye dress. I wasn't gonna do the big expensive white thing. In fact, I think, Scott, you were white, right? <laughs> I wore color. <laughs> It wasn't my thing, but I felt compelled, and I, I realized what was happening. These were not ordinary women. If you look at the dresses and the crowns and the veils that women wear, uh, I think now the average wedding costs $30,000. That's not an average event. That's not even an average rite of passage. That's something archetypal happening, right? We're being sold this image of extraordinary liminality. And so I found these brides and I cut out over a thousand of them because um, that's just how weird I am. Let's see if this works. I wanted to show you my brides. There you go. <laughs> so I'm cutting these brides and it's the midst of the Me Too, hashtag Me Too movement and it seemed critical for me to celebrate the elevated female body. And because for Carl Jung, the bride, the alchemical bride, is a symbol for um, the whole self, the self and the shadow united, so a fully individuated human being. I thought, what could be better to use as a symbol in my paintings of self-transformation? Um, and so I started this series. Um, and what I did is I created 
this, let's see if I can make this happen. Yeah. There we go. So I created this alchemical wheel, which has correlates in alchemy and alchemical processes with verbs. This is a very famous list, Richard Serra's list of verbs. There are things to do to create artwork, such as to drop, to remove, to simplify, uh, to use entropy or gravity, to shave, to tear, to chip, to split, to cut. And so here, for example, I have multiplication, serialize, um, prolectation. So I have these wheels that I've created that, cr that create correlates between alchemy and the studio actions. And this is one of the ways in which I bring the, or invite the irrational subconscious to partner with me in activating the alchemical bright archetype and to bring about a transformation. So I'm not just painting them, I'm also inviting that chemical, alchemical process. The latest of my alchemical brides is this piece, La Boveda, My Mother's Kitchen. And let's take a look at this for a moment. <laughs> become a Santeria dress. Does anybody here know what Santeria is? Yeah, because you read the Cuban book, yeah. So Santeria is um, a religion born out of the enslaved Africans brought to Cuba. And it's syncretic, so it mixes a lot of Catholic imagery with African uh, ancestor worship and animism. And so, my mother's kitchen, La Boveda, is my ancestral um, altar. So I have one. I'm a Buddhist. I'm not, I was consecrated in Yalocha when I was a child, but I left the religion. And so when you're consecrated, you wear white for a year, like a bride. You actually, there are a lot of different rituals, which I'm not going to talk about, but this, this performance begins and ends with ritual dance, uh, which is a part of religious, um, religious observance, and also uh, is a language, right? Just, just like painting is a language, filmmaking is a language. So there are ways in which the archetypes of different deities are communicated through the body. And it also told the story of my father's death and my mother's surviving him and how religion um, both helped and hurt her in that in in the subsequent uh, years. So I I wear the bridal gown, and I I come in carrying my luggage, <laughs> like all of us we carry our luggage through life, and I remove things during the performance. I act them, and then I leave with my my luggage. And the luggage is my rational mind. The performance is my dream state and then I waken at the end and leave again with my baggage. So that's um, one of the latest iterations of The Bride. Here's another one. Um, this is the Agora, it's a, an example of layering of image, concept, idea, or media and language. In the slide, to the left is a concept drawing which was suggested from a spin of the alchemical wheel that had me serializing, installing, and projecting. 
So these are the same things as La Boveda. I did the spin, <laughs> and I got projection, <laughs> serializing, performance, and so I knew what I was going to do. Um, so here, I created a bunch of sculptural paintings on vellum, and they each take the shape of Archimedean solids or platonic solids uh, and prisms, and each commemorates a different woman who um, was a tangible emblem during her lifetime. And the title of the piece, the Agora, alludes to various meanings. So it alludes to the reciprocal nature of conversations, to the act of substituting one thing for another, and to a trade. And uh, so they can be projected, or they, they're installed, and then there's lights that project them, and there's also a sound, project, sound projection. So I recorded myself creating the pieces and so when this is installed, the lights change and it looks like the city, the agora is changing throughout time and then you hear the sounds from my studio so that you are in the gallery, in front of the images and hearkening back to the act of being made by participating in the audio that happens. Um, and you can see that this in itself, the installation is a platonic solid concept, because it's a three-dimensional pyramid. Right? So this just gives you an idea of how these things work. Um, and here you can see how I set up my boxes. And these are the boxes I paint from. And I play with lights. Um, and so here's an example of the kind of paintings that this Alchemical Bride series has created. And each one of the paintings in the series, and there's over 100 at this point, I stopped counting <laughs> after like 170 or something. Um, this piece is uh, named after Elizabeth Norse. And Elizabeth Norse was a very famous artist during her lifetime. And, um, Nobody's ever heard of her. I've never seen one of her works in person. And this is the one title. That's one book. So in art, in art history, your importance is marked by linear feet in the library. <laughs> How many? So, um, so she is, um, let me see. There's just this one book. When I look at um, James McNeil Whistler, let's go back, um, there's 137 books about him, and he was her contemporary. Um, in fact, if you look at the, both their wiki pages, she won several more honors than he did. But we all know who Whistler is, you know, Whistler's mom. We all know about Whistler. And no shade on him. He's wonderful. But I would have liked to know about Elizabeth Norse. I would like to be able to see her work when she was much more famous in her lifetime. So I think for me as a visual artist, for me as a woman, for me as a doing the alchemical bride, I like to dedicate each one of these transformational portraits to a woman who has been forgotten by history or erased by history. Her kind. I have gone out a possessed witch haunting the black air, braver at night. Dreaming evil, I have done my hitch over the plain houses. Light by light, lonely thing, twelve-fingered, out of mind. A woman like that is not a woman quite. I have been her kind. I have found the warm caves in the woods. Fill them with skillets, carving, shells, closets, silks, innumerable goods. Fix the supper for the worms and the elves, whining, rearranging the disalign. A woman like that is misunderstood. I have been her kind. I have ridden in your cart, driver, waved my nude arms at villages going by. Learning the last bright roots 
survivor where your flames still bite my thigh, and my ribs crack where your wheels won. A woman like that is not ashamed to die. I have been her kind. So that was Anne Sexton reading her amazing poem, Her Kind, which I think describes pretty much every woman that my Alchemical Bride series honors. Um, so the witch is a shadow archetype. She's a symbol of what happens to any intelligent, gifted woman forced into the suffocating confines of a mediocre suburban culture. For her, it was tragic. She committed suicide, right? Now, not all the women. <laughs> no, Anne Sexton. No, Hedy Lamar did not commit suicide. Uh, and, and she did not live a mediocre suburban life. She actually was a very well-known actress, right? Um, but how many of you know that she's also the mother of Wi-Fi? <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty remarkable. So she, um, during World War II, partnered, um, who did she partner to? Yeah, uh, with George Antile. And they invented a communication system that involved the use of frequency hopping among radio waves. See, I have to read this because I don't know what it means with both transmitter and receiving, receiver hopping to new frequencies together. Her patent was awarded in 1942 and expired before she could ever make a penny from it. Uh, but her role in this invention was forgotten and then remembered just a few years ago, she was awarded, long after her death, she was awarded a medal for that. So in popular culture, her genius was erased and only her beauty remembered. Um, and so that's a different kind of shadow, right? The shadow we project onto women, um, erasing so many of their accomplishments. Um, so that's Hedy Lamar. That's my portrait of this other artist. And of course, I have Anne Sexton portraits too. I don't know why I didn't pair Anne Sexton's portrait. <laughs> and I gave you Hedy Lamar instead, because um, it's such an interesting um, story. So um, this is a view of um, my exhibit, Her Kind. I had over a hundred paintings and drawings, each named after a woman like Hedy Lamar, Anne Sexton, Anna Mendieta, <laughs> and so on. I also had some of my films. So just to give you an idea of how much I'm driven to participate in the archetype of the bride. Um, this was at CWU. It was during the pandemic, right at the tail end of the pandemic. Uh, my last solo show, I haven't had one since. I had a couple that were canceled. The one at Salem was canceled. Money. All right, let me not use this, I'll use this. Um, here's some other archetypes in the studio. We've kind of looked a lot at the drive. This is um, shadow boxing, and this project activates the archetype of the warrior. So just to give you a little um, backdrop, I, for two years, on a daily basis, I drew cells for this animation, it's hand drawn. It's not using an app. And before that, I went into training. I've never boxed in my life or kickboxed. <laughs> you know, I'm a good Cuban girl. I took ballet lessons and flamenco lessons. Wasn't good at either of those, by the way. I like boxing a lot more. Um, but um, I took this hand drawing as a kind of ritual to parallel the tedium of drawing to the daily battle that we have against othering in our bodies, particularly during the Trump administration. Because on a daily basis, he was throwing shade on shadow boxing, shade on Latinx, 
we were all a bunch of bad hombres. And in fact, I, I wondered, even though I'm a naturalized citizen, whether I would have to seek citizenship elsewhere, because he talked about even naturalized citizens might have their, they weren't born here, might have their citizenship revoked. And I'm like, well, this is a madman. I mean, and I have family that voted for him. But, you know, this is me speaking frankly. This is what happened to me. The song is an African song, Santeria, from my days in Santeria, and it calls on the archetypal warrior to come and save the community. And one of the things I never talk about is it's not just about the othering that other place on you, but the othering we internalize. So that aspect, for me as a Latinx, but everybody has a way in which they've been othered. Every single one of us has a way in which we've been othered um, and how we internalize those judgments. You notice that the skeleton is at once outside and inside, <laughs> comes in and out of my fighting body. So here's another archetype. This is the archetype of paradise, also known as the Madonna archetype, the Earth Mother, the return to the womb. And here, looking for paradise. Um, so the mother archetype is intimately tied to the land, which for the United States is also linked to manifest destiny. And white Americans use the concept of manifest destiny to justify westward expansion in the US in the 19th century. 
and that increased white settlement trans of in industry transformed the landscape. Um, and so nowadays we have the idea of the sublime and of the grandeur of the landscape is a cyborg one. You know, only, only national forests have areas of pristine landscape left. And even there, you know, we have, <laughs> where I, you know, I like to go hiking. I like to go camping, not as much as hiking. Um, and there is manicured areas, right? Um, and then, of course, nature is not just the landscape, but nature, part of that paradise, are our fellow inhabitants on this earth, and a lot of that is, again, cyborged. So our greatest experience of wildlife happens in parks and in zoos and in museums. And so in this archetype, I go out with my camera and I specifically photograph how we have contained the wildness of nature, the wildness, our longing for paradise in displays. I also engage the archetype of poor. And this is me, this is, I have two beards. <laughs> this is my, it's, I kid you not, this is called a uh, Bieber beard. This is, you know, the singer? Yeah, this is a Justin Bieber beard. Um, and I, I wear this in the studio when I do the poor. Um, so poor Eternus is the eternal man-child, is one of the basic human personality archetypes described by Jung and expresses a hunger for independence and freedom. Poor is opposed to boundaries and limits and prefers living in his own head instead of reality. It's, I definitely know about poor. Um, so I, I become a man. Uh, when I paint the poor series. And um, he can't be constrained, so he travels through, through um, a magical device called an iPhone and Google Earth and experiences the landscape. And he's a transcendentalist, uh, so his Aleph from Jorge Luis Borges' story becomes an iPhone, and this is this painting is from that series, and you can see it's a very different language from my other work. Um, and this is actually the first piece that this, the um, Seattle of Office of Arts and Culture ever collected of mine. I had to be a man for Seattle to collect my work. Now they, now they collected, they've collected bride work too. Um, but I'm just saying that I had to be a man to break the ice. Um, and this is no uncommon destination. He's off in his little boat going on an adventure. This is from the Hangman Archetype, the Migration Series. And I actually have to uh, credit Susan for embarking me on this exploration because she invited me to do a series, a couple of shows, a number of shows, and three shows. And that's what got me started on um, digging into my own history and exploring this archetype, which is very painful for me. The memories I have are, are very profound. Um, so here are two, two uh, pieces from that. On the one side, you have no hiding place down here. This was um, an installation. I built a tent out of theatrical scrim. And there's a sound projection with a narrative talking about my time as an immigrant without a home, uh, my family's homelessness. And then I also have portraits of Seattle's homeless. And this is a homeless in encampment. The city of Seattle um, commissioned this piece. And my husband, I've commissioned him to take the photos of the encampments that we visited. Um, and so his photos are also projected here. And then on the other side is another series um, or another piece from the series. So you can see very different language from we've seen animation, we've seen painting, uh, photograph, and here, sculptural installation. There is a military blanket embroidered with all of the um, torture techniques used on my father by the Hedos. And what's really upsetting is that they are torture techniques that are also used in Guantanamo by the US government. So this is uninterrupted 
torture from both my homelands. And that's again the shadow interfering with, with my family. And then above it is a photograph of myself wrapped. Is it time? Like this. Now you can hear me. So thank you. Um, so that's that photograph of me wrapped. And why do I wrap myself? Because my father's DNA is in me. And why is the blanket on an empty chair? Because my father died at 36 years old. He never survived the effects of the torture. And so this is called Beforehand Afterwards. Uh, and it's a part of the series. And so I, I'm going to give credit to, uh, <laughs> to Susan for that piece. And for this one, this is The Unraveling. And this is, I'm just, I'm not going to show the whole video like I did the other one because, I'm, you know, it's, you guys have been sitting here for a while. I don't know about you, but my butt would hurt. Um, so this is how immigration policies and police actions unraveled my family ties. You'll hear Puccini's Visi de Arte, which is a haunting aria. Um, and it formally links my family's tragedies to larger historical narratives. And the reason I use this aria is my mother suffered deeply after my father's death and, uh, and after his incarceration. And one of the things that she would do is she would uh, blare opera. I don't like opera. Um, but this, this is a beautiful piece. Hardlined. The three men who took my father in the middle of the night they did not think to look beyond their party line. They had orders. There was a signature on the dotted line. And it was the end of the road. They didn't see the connections between May, Mami, Cachita, Abuelo, Abuela, Minita, Uncle Rudy, Papi, or me. They didn't see how tugging that thread and cutting that tie would unravel everything. <laughs> Mommy lost her faith that night. She lost the love of her life and whatever hope had kept her from going savage, from stepping out of line. Here's another short clip from that same series. This is called Mi Fidel. And this is, this is, um, I think, probably my favorite performance. I take the text of one of Fidel Castro's UN speeches, and he's a famous orator. He's an amazing orator. So much so that he's become a brand, right? Even now, after his death, his ideas and charisma endure. And while I am reciting his really, and, and you'll be able to read, I did the, I did the translation because I didn't know how to do it otherwise. My husband has shown me since how to, how to get it done. Uh, there's an app for that. Um, but I did this personally. I translated from Spanish into English, so you'll be able to follow along with what he's saying. So while I'm mimicking his gestures and his words, silently across my body are projections of dissidents who have been imprisoned and tortured, of the women in white who protest they're missing, and so on. So let's take a look. No se puede hablar de paz. En nombre de decenas de millones de seres humanos que mueren cada uno de los años de hambre o enfermedades curables en todo el mundo. No se puede hablar de paz. En nombre de 900 millones de analfabetos. La exploitación de los países pobres por los países ricos, debe de cesar. Sé que en muchos de los países pobres hay también explotadores y explotados. 
me dirijo a las naciones ricas para que contribuyan. It's very difficult to fight against the beauty of his words. It's the praxis that's the problem, right? Um, and so there we have, again, the shadow. And it continues, you know, he's dead. And Raul Castro has already retired. But we still have that problem in Cuba. I can skip them. Let's leave it here. Let's leave it here. Um, it has been an hour, <laughs> basically. So I, I leave you as I started with Cuba <laughs> and with my family. I was going to leave it on a higher note, something fun. But um, let's leave it here. And does anybody have questions? Do you have anything you'd like to ask? What year was the photograph of your family taken at the beginning? I believe that was in 1959 or 1960, so shortly after the revolution. My brother was born in revolutionary Cuba, and actually. You weren't born yet. No, I wasn't born yet. Tell us about your father. Was he a dissident? In what circumstances? Well, this is a, a great mystery because my father wasn't a very political man except as an idealist. So he's in Spain while the revolution starts, meets my mom, they marry, she gets pregnant right away, they didn't have birth control. And they come back to Cuba and give birth. And my father joins, he's a doctor. He's a doctor. And he joins the Cuban army to support the revolution. I remember I grew up, my father, before we were punished, my father had a free clinic that he ran. My father's family was wealthy, was powerful. So, you know, there's a reason. <laughs> it's like the Kennedys, right? But in Cuba, the Socarras, the Garmentias were all doctors. So they weren't politically active. But my, my grandmother's side, the Socarras family, was very politically active. So he himself, you know, just fell in disfavor. He did ask to leave the country. And under Cuban um, and communist regimes, professionals are considered an asset. So when you're leaving the country, I mean, that's one of the cr great criticisms that the communist level at the US, that they pilfer the intelligentsia. They, they, fil they pilfer the, the educated class. Um, so, but he asked to leave because his whole family was here. And it was, it was becoming more and more evident that um, Castro was in Russia's pocket. Right? I mean, my father had Russian friends. I have a <laughs> Russian name. <laughs> I was named after a Russian dancer that my family knew, that my parents knew, a ballerina. I, I can't dance ballet for the life of me, whatever her name. So why did he fall in disfavor? We don't know. We don't know. Um, some of the fellow doctors that he knew were arrested and tortured, so very likely they just named him. I have a very distinct memory of when they took my father. Um, we were already in the camp, and the Hedos came. It was in the middle of the night, and they knocked down the door. And my, fa my, my father and mother were sleeping in an alcove. Myself and Nanny were, Nana was sleeping in another alcove, and my brother was sleeping right at the entry on a cot. And when they knocked down the door, 
they started yelling, and so we all came out. And they asked my brother his name, and his name is the same as my father, Sosa Manuel Garmendia. And he told them their name. My brother was not even eight years old yet. And these men with machine guns shot right over his head. My, my little brother, I mean, he was older than me, but he was, he was a little boy. And he, he wet his pants, right? And he wet them every day until we left Cuba. It's like his body remembered that trauma. He didn't remember. The next day, we'd forgotten what it was. We used to, we didn't have tissues. We used to flick our boogers into the holes on the, on the walls because we were little kids. We didn't know any better, right? Like the tragedy of that. And the Hedos took my father, and we didn't see him for two years. And when he got out, he looked like a skeleton, and he was catatonic, and he never fully recovered. He, he died here in the US. Um, to get out of the country, my mother was a Spanish citizen. And so since my father was incapacitated, he became her ward. And my brother and I became her ward. Well, her children were her wards. And so we all left repatriated on her Spanish passport as her, you know, she became the head of the family. So we, it's still a mystery, we don't know. I mean, possibly the fact that my uncle had fought in the Bay of Pigs, but my father was on the other side. So why, why does any of that happen? Because people in power say it does. You know, say so. People turn each other in all the time. When the wall came down in, in East Berlin, they found reams and reams of records of neighbors telling on neighbors and for any, any reason. It doesn't have to have a something rational behind it. That was a long answer. <laughs> Very important. Anybody else? Okay. I think you're all pretty stunned by this uh, phenomenal presentation. I know I am. Even though I've known Tatiana for years and years, I have never actually heard you speak before like this, so it was really very special, and I want to thank you very much. 